credit is money, to make it simple. And credit creation is the process of printing money. Okay, that's very scary now. Printing money, your brain is going to central banks. Just take this concept and throw it in a bin. Welcome to the Gold Republic Podcast. My name is Bart Brandt. And I'm Alexei Jordanov. In our weekly podcast, we invite guests from all over the world to get valuable insights into the emergence of a new monetary system through the lens of precious metals, cryptocurrencies, and other financial instruments. Welcome to the Gold Republic Podcast. Today we have the honor to actually host here in physical, <laughs> in flesh, Alfonso. Alfonso, we actually had an interview uh, planned last week, Friday, and uh, we found out that you actually live in Warm, which is uh, not even like half an hour away from here. And we said like, actually, why don't you come over, right? <laughs> yes, actually, when I arrived today in Amsterdam, I live 30 minutes away. I, I had to touch you guys to see if you're real. <laughs> this is the first <laughs> live meeting I have uh, basically over the last two years. So it's great to be here. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to have you as well. Um, today, we'll talk about all kinds of things. But actually, one of my first questions is... Um, First, why did you create the Macro Compass? Because you've um, um, worked in a, in a bank, ING, uh, for in Germany. You managed uh, a twenty billion dollar, uh, twenty billion euro fund. Um, so you were with the big Kahunas, uh, and <laughs> all of a sudden, you said, "Screw that! I'm going to start my own thing." So what happened, and why? What is it, and why did you do that? So let's say that people with big cojones are definitely not working in uh, in the financial industry, or they're working probably there, but also elsewhere, uh, I would say. Uh, so I was managing a large portfolio, that's true. But at some point, I, I realized that putting my knowledge out there for people is really what drives me. It's what makes me happy. And so as I was already putting out some stuff before on other social media, I decided to make it a more... Uh, well-organized and hopefully better formatted version of uh, online financial education, macroeconomic insights, investment ideas as well, why not, on a newsletter. And that's called the Macro Compass. And uh, well, basically, I now do this full time. Uh, it's a free newsletter. Everybody can read it. It's just my thoughts out there. Mm -hmm. um, as I have some experience in the field, having managed a portfolio and you know, having spoken to the big guys out there for a lot of years, I thought, you know, a lot of this needs to be shared and needs to be uh, democratized financial knowledge at the end of the day. So who am I just to keep it for myself? Mm -hmm. So here we are. And I think one of the really interesting points that we had actually uh, while uh, drinking our little espressos and uh, <laughs> getting some uh, Italian uh, pastries is uh, we were talking about our motivations and uh, we touch upon also the fact that it's a bit of a game, right? And that most people, peers uh, in your industry as well, don't even know why. And basically this whole construct has been built out since uh, we could say the the, the, the deep pegging of gold uh, to the dollar created this kind of like huge bubble or lack of understanding of where we're going. How do you feel about that? So I'm... Um... It's a bit weird, actually, to see people that are um, in the industry sometimes, well, pretty often, actually, using outdated or outright wrong assumptions that should be the backbone of our financial system. So, for instance, we discussed before about money, the construct of money. And today, you still have probably 90 to 90%, 90 to 95% of people out there uh, still believing that money is actually lent by bank via lending deposits or via using uh, reserves and then lending them out. Well, this has been empirically proven wrong. And there was basically a theory in the beginning of the 1900s that effectively um, postulated that money is created out of thin air by banks every time they lend and by the government with another mechanism and not lent out out of deposits, already existing deposits, or already existing bank reserves. That's not how it works. But then, basically, we had a new wave of theories that brought back the wrong assumptions that banks lend deposits or lend reserves. And today's, I mean, if you ask uh, the average person working in the financial industry, it would still look at banks having deposits and then lending some deposits away, or banks having X reserves and lending those reserves away. And those are people that work in the financial industry. That's mesmerizing. <laughs> Not to talk about 
the university courses that are still built on Keynesian, post-Keynesian, and you know these kind of theories that have some merits, but when it comes to the construct of money, they are mostly wrong. Well, that is something I I think we're going to try to deep dive into that that um, uh, subject a little bit more a little bit later in 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 the interview, but you you spoke about the fundamentals and theories that are right here and and a lot of what we could say are the narratives in the markets and so the question is how do you explain this almost we have a a everything bubble but we also have a bubble of narratives so everybody believes something else and and they are completely invested in in their own narrative and there are um, so many how do you explain or clarify your side of what your narrative is and how do you explain all those other narrative, narratives out there? So Bart, the key is polarization and that is a um, very vicious trend we have, a, we have been observing in, in, in the financial industry. Opinions are very polarized. So either Bitcoin is going to a million dollars or it's worth zero. There is no gray area. And that's a typical example I always bring for polarization. The reality is that um, it's fine to have a narrative that you use as your base case scenario, but you should think in probabilistic scenarios, which means you have a base case. Everybody has a base case. We are opinionated humans. That is fine. You should also assume that this base case has a 50, 60, 70% probability of realizing, and then there are tails on the right and on the left, or different probabilistic scenarios that might unfold and prove you wrong. This sort of probabilistic approach is what the most successful investors out there actually apply when investing. They have a base case, they invest according to their base case, obviously, but they always have on the back of their mind the other scenarios they haven't considered. And what happens if? Are they hedged if? While the average market commentator or financial discussion is completely polarized. And that is something that is detrimental to financial education out there. So what I try to do is to bring out a nuanced, credible, empirical version of how certain things work, try to explain it thoroughly, and then tell people, this is the macro narrative that I am following right now, and please assume I can be wrong. Mm -hmm. And also, please debate with me what are the underlying assumptions behind the micro narrative. Now, one thing is the macro narrative. The other thing is the construct of money, where there are empirical, almost you, you might say scientific studies describing how the monetary system works. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there that can be clarified in a more firm basis. Macro narratives, on the other hand, can be right or wrong, but they're often very polarized. That's, I think, a great point. And also one of the things I want to point out is for any viewer or listener, if you go through your um, uh, Substack uh, on your newsletter, um, what I love is also what I really appreciate and generally uh, say so is your intellectual honesty. And I think that's that's really more than needed nowadays. And also this uh, literally said, yeah, I might be 55% right and uh, 45% totally wrong. And I think that's something that a lot of people also uh, value and appreciate in, in the the intellectual uh, exercise of it as well. Uh, thanks for that, Alexei. But I think this is, um, if, if you manage money professionally or if you would talk to a hedge fund manager, uh, then he would definitely know that he's wrong plenty of times mm. because he sees that every day. And the most important thing is not to have a an ego attached to a certain view or a certain investment or a certain trade. If you're proven wrong, both by price action or by macro developments, if it was a macro narrative, and facts have changed, you should change your opinion too. Mm, yeah. And that actually leads us to another question because you're n the name of your uh, Substack is Macro Compass, right? So you're navigating the basically, um, well, wild, turbulent waters, uh, oceans and whatever not, of uh, the financial and the monetary environment. Um, and thereby, what would be your guiding North Star? in terms of a framework or the way you basically perceive the market when you have the, uh, your macro glasses and you look into all that craziness? Yeah, so 
the answer lies in the macro compass itself, which is a compass with four quadrants. It's very simple, and it has two axes, x-axis and y-axis, and therefore two main north stars, if we can call them like that. The most important one is uh, what I call the credit impulse, which might sound an extremely complicated concept. It's Savage. Really, it, <laughs> it's really not. So uh, bear with me for a second. Credit impulse. So let's start from credit. Credit is the process of, basically credit is money, to make it simple. And credit creation is the process of printing money. Okay, that's very scary now. Printing money, your brain is going to central banks. Just take this concept and throw it in a bin. Back with me, credit, money, money creation. Money creation happens twofolds, commercial banks and governments. Did I say central banks? No, I didn't. The credit creation I focus on is the money that flows through the private sector. The private sector is you, I, and Bart. Bart, Alexei, Alf. The new spendable money that ends in our hands. There are two forms. Bills, literally like money, coins, and bank deposits. Today, the money, the incremental money, newly created money that we can spend, is 97% bank deposits and 3% physical cash, coins, whatever. The creators of new coins and new, bank, let's say new bank deposits, let's ignore the coins and the physical cash that's marginal nowadays. Creator of new bank deposits are commercial banks. How? Every time they lend and they decide that Alexei or Bart are worth of a, of a loan to buy a car or whatever that is, they literally create new deposits. So they basically Bart works in a, uh, walks in a bank and says, I'd like to buy a new car tomorrow. And the bank, if you literally look at uh, the Professor Werner uh, paper on this, he empirically proven, proved that walking in a bank and asking for a new loan does not entail the bank to look into how many deposits they have or how many reserves they have before lending. They have a license to lend, which is basically given by the central bank that supervises the commercial bank. Once they obtain this license to lend, in order to lend, they just need customer, which is credit worth, whose credit worthiness is good enough for them to lend money and to take the risk reward of getting a loan yield from Bartol Exer from, from the loan I've just given and uh, basically having enough capital who attached to this loan because there is some regulation that forces bank to own capital against the loans to basically preserve their capital stability. It's fractional reserve banking. Nope, it's no, not. collateral. Right? And, and here we go. Now, mm -hmm. th there is the second, the second part is that reserves are also not a constraint on bank lending. So reserves are an item that sits on the asset side of a bank, like loans do. Those are not inter-exchangeable between each other. Reserves are nothing else than uh, a way for banks to settle payments against each other. So if I just make now a bank payment, a transfer of bank deposit to BART, and I use bank A and BART uses bank B, the two banks will settle against each other payments, so withdrawals or um, your bank account being credited or debited, debit, on the background via using bank reserves. That's what, what they will do. And the only um, actors in the financial system that can use bank reserves are banks, few other financial institutions. They can only settle against each other and against the central bank. It's a closed system. Those bank reserves do never end in the real economy. Basically under almost no circumstance, which means that those bank reserves are just a a liquidity, a settlement instrument. That's what they are. They sit on the asset side on the balance sheet like loans, and they are not necessarily a constraint to lending. Mm. Constraint to lending is having a customer whose credit worthiness is good, good enough for the bank to have a good risk reward in lending and the bank having enough capital and willing to put this capital at risk while, while lending. And Professor Werner proved that walking in a bank, it exactly works like that. There is nobody checking how many deposits they have, how many reserves they have, simply because it's effectively irrelevant 
or the lending decision of a bank. They will check if your credit worthiness is good enough. Yes, they will do that. And ultimately, they will check the risk reward. So is regulation requiring capital, uh, let's say, in a, in a large fashion to be attached to the loan, therefore I require pretty large yield to lend this money? Yes or no? Is this trade-off good enough? If yes, they will lend. When they lend, the balance sheet of the banking system, now imagine the entire banking system, balance sheet of the banking system expands, which means that you, Bart, now have new, newly created money to go and buy the car. You're going to buy it from me. I'm going to sell the car to you. Now, instead of a car, I have a bank deposit because you paid me most likely in a bank deposit. You just transferred money digitally. Mm. That's what you did. So you end up having a car now. I have a newly created bank deposit that is matching your new loan effectively, right? So the entire banking system has just expanded. It might not be the same bank, and often it's not the same bank because I might bank with another commercial bank different than yours. But if you look at the aggregate banking system, what has happened is that the balance sheet of the banking system has expanded. Back to the point, there are more bank deposits in the system than there were before. And hmm. bank deposits, 90% of bank deposits are usable, spendable money in the real economy. I had a car, I now have a bank deposit. You had nothing, you, <laughs> you now have a car, thanks to the loan that has been extended by the banking system out of thin air. Not using a former deposit, a new deposit has been created now. I have it. I had a car before. You had nothing. You now have a loan. That loan is newly created money, which is reflected in the deposit I now have at maybe another bank, but the entire banking mm. system balance sheet has expanded. So the credit impulse effectively measures the, uh, the, the, the pace of growth of credit. And this credit is created by banks, as we discussed, and then by the government. I'm going to stop after that for you to ask questions. How does the government create money? Well, the government is an interesting institution. They literally have the monopoly on money creation, on fiat money creation. This monopoly is then um, put into use via the commercial banking system. I mean, ultimately, it's the central bank that gives away the license to commercial banks to lend, and the central bank is an arm of the government, which is formally independent from the government, but it's an arm of the government at the end of the day. The government itself also uses its power to print money by literally doing deficits. A government deficit is effectively a transfer of net worth to the private sector. When a government spends more money than it intends to tax back from the private sector, it's literally adding assets, add, no, assets is not the right word, adding net worth to the private sector. Like an easy example is America 2021. The government spent about, I think, $5 trillion uh, between 2020 and 2021. These $5 trillion were mostly in stimulus checks, which literally meant that the government sent checks to the American people's houses, and it pretty clearly did not intend to tax back the private sector to get back these resources. Now, all of a sudden, the private sector has much more money than it had before. This money is, again, bank deposits. I mean, literally, the American takes the check, goes at the bank, mm -hmm. and the physical cash, just forget it for a second, 97% will be a bank deposit. So you will have more money in a bank, right? This bank deposit can be spent, and it didn't exist before, and it's been literally created by the government, printing money out of thin air, doing deficits, and not asking the private sector some resources back for this money. So it doesn't increase taxes. It literally increases the net worth of the private sector. The result of that is, again, bank deposits. Credit impulse, therefore, measures the pace of growth of this credit creation. And why do I say the pace of growth and not just the growth of credit? It's because our system is built inherently to create new credit. It's a feature of our system since 1971. It's a feature of any system that is based on full, uh, fully elastic credit creation backed by no explicit hard asset or no explicit asset, one can say. So 
the growth is a feature. We, we create credit. We, we do it. It's a feature of the system. It's the pace of this creation that matters. Are we creating incrementally new credit at a very fast pace or at a very slow pace? Mm. Because the definition is that 95% of the times we are creating credit. Yeah, and that, that actually, uh, and as an Italian, uh, creditare is uh, the belief, right? The trust in, in, in someone. And, and that there comes, I think, also like the, um, the intellectual uh, challenge to call those two conflicting ideas being one credit that is actually not worthy of any trust because it's not backed by anything. So it's kind of corrupted credit, but that inflates then also like, also that's now not a narrative. What uh, we see now with inflation with uh, 7% uh, now uh, uh, headline inflation in the, in the U S uh, about approximately almost the same here in Europe. I think it's hovering of about five something percent. Um, and there, There comes again now the, 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 the bubbly part of things, right? From a concept perspective, have the idea that um, also this meme, like um, money printer goes brrr, and you see like Paul like printing money into infinitum. And that is a kind of common belief that it comes from the central bank. And I think you've outlined it perfectly. And I would also encourage a lot of people to look at Richard Werner interview on RT or Rush Today. I think he made outlined it also perfectly as well and wrote a book about it. Um, but then comes the moment of, um, I, <laughs> actually we're talking about this, like whatflation. <laughs> it's because on one side, we've just talked about the fact that a money creation doesn't implicitly mean that it is the central bank creating inflation because the expansion that you just talked about is from uh, the private sector. So how, how do you basically hold all this concept together and uh, uh, get a grasp of um, if we're even in actual inflationary times? If we're in disinflationary times, if, if we're in deflationary times, if we're in stagflationary times, like all those Uh, uh, what I call whatflations is basically what also confuses a lot of people in the narrative. And I know it's also a matter of cycles and states that maybe we're right now in an inflationary period that we might then go down to disinflationary period and maybe end up in a deflationary monetary period because of debasement or any like other uh, event that might happen. How do you make sense of that? So to make sense of that, we have to explain how the system works because I said before, creating credit is an inherent feature of our system. And why is that? Um, there are two main drivers of long-term growth. If you are in a human society, and these two drivers are um, working age, population growth and productivity. Let, let me break it down. Working age population growth sounds very scary, but it's literally the amount of people that are actively contributing to society, which means they are in the workforce. And as you are talking about growth rates, you look at the growth rate of this working age population, and it looks bad. It has, been look, it has peaked in the 80s, and since then, the rate of growth has been going down, which means it's still growing, but at a lesser pace than before. And the reason why is because people are growing older, living a longer life, which means they retire approximately at the same age, a bit later now, but still they, they, they live longer and we're making much less kids than before, which means the workforce reduces or, or grows at a very small pace year after year. That's the first driver of growth. And the second one is productivity productivity of this labor force and productivity of capital. So in, in, in economics, you would say total factor productivity. And if you look at different studies of this productivity, you would find out that it's stagnating at about 1% year on year growth. It depends on the jurisdiction, but you know, remember this is the rate of growth of productivity. So you become more productive year after year, but in, by a tiny bit mm. year after year. So you look at these two drivers, You have a bit of productivity, rate of growth of productivity, and very little workforce growth, which means if you let the economy run at potential and you do nothing else, then you're going to grow at about 1% a year, something like that. Doesn't sound very good, does it? Not really. Humans like to grow fast, and now politicians like to be reelected. Therefore, after 1971, we have discovered we have a fantastic new model. The new model is to create credit. 
which means borrowing from future consumption, which literally means I can now buy a house in whatever, in the Netherlands for half a million euros and I don't have half a million euros in my bank account, which means by accessing credit, remember, as described before, newly created money out of thin air by the mm-hmm. commercial banking sector, I can now buy a house of 500,000 euros that I didn't have before. Cool, right? Which means you anticipate effectively, you bring forward all future consumption because this credit either needs to be rolled over or you will extinguish the newly created money by paying back this credit or this debt. By rolled over, you mean like extended, extended basically? Extended again, okay. right? So if you look at the pace of credit creation from the 80s to today, over the last 40 years, it's been ridiculous to the point that the flip coin of credit is debt. And if you look at the private sector debt and the public sector debt, as percentage of income that I like, I like much better than percentage of GDP, it's, it's at record highs. So we are talking about the private sector being levered about six times their income and the public sector being levered about a gazillion times their tax receipts. Okay? So looking at both gives you an idea of the two sides of the coin and how much credit creation has been, has been there. So the government, by running deficits, which is money creation, as we discussed before, accumulates further uh, credit creation over time. The same as the private sector by borrowing more and more. To buy houses, to buy, if you're a corporate, you borrow to basically invest or bring consumption forward. So we have created a huge amount of credit. And by doing so, we have effectively uh, brought forward more and more consumption. And when you do that, as you consume today, and you basically oil the real economy with this new created credit, you grow more, much more than the 1% structural growth we discussed. You grow at 2 at 3 at 4%. Everybody's happy. Wow, it's amazing, right? So it's one line up in terms of credit creation, straight line, and there are some cycles around, right? Sometimes we tried in Europe austerity. Austerity meant destroying money. It meant deleveraging the private sector. It meant going to the guy who borrowed and said, you are a sinner. You need to deleverage. You need to pay back. The government will not run deficits. It will run surpluses on top. So it will demand BART to pay and to transfer back the net worth from BART to the government. And then if BART has a loan, it needs to repay the loan as well because it's losing its job. So it's effectively deleveraging. It's what Richard Ku called balance sheet recession in Japan. Mm. Japan has been doing this already. It's, it's, it's a monetary experiment plus a fiscal experiment they've been trying for 25 years. This is nothing new. Japan has tried it before because their demographics have worsened much faster than the European and the US and the Chinese demographics. Now it's our turn in Europe. Well, the US has joined as well the party uh, over the last 40 years. Wherever you look, credit creation has been the way for um, society and politics to deliver better growth. Now, obviously, the problem with this credit creation is that you need to service your debt. Remember, the flip side of credit is debt. So if you borrow to buy a house of 500,000 euro in Amsterdam and the borrowing rates are 5% and your salary doesn't increase in real terms, it's very hard for asset prices to go up because the next guy that needs to borrow 600,000 euro with the same salary at 5%, he can't afford it. It's impossible. So then the trick is you make, you continue to create new credit incremental. So remember the credit impulse. So the incremental credit creation goes up, but you make new credit cheaper. Next guy that comes after Bart having bought a house for 500,000 euro, Bart has borrowed at 5%. The new guy can borrow at 4%. Now, if the new guy borrows at 4%, then his monthly installments, so the amount he needs to pay, remember, you need to service his debt, compared to his income, his salary, if his salary has gone a tiny bit up and interest rates have gone down, so the borrowing costs have reduced, he can afford it. Now, Bart's house is worth 550,000 euro, which means that Bart 
feels wealthy. He has generated so far paper until he sells, but still capital gains. On the back of these capital gains, Bart will feel more wealthy, perhaps will spend a bit more. It's a virtuous cycle on paper, which I call at the macro compass the wealth illusion effect. Mm. You bring forward more and more consumption by creating new credit, bank lending, government printing deficits all over the world. You make this new credit cheaper such that the next person can afford borrowing and therefore oiling the credit creation system. That's what we do. So coming now back to the whatflation? <laughs> the answer to the whatflation question is that if the pace of credit impulse is very high, very strong, then you get inflation. When the pace of credit impulse is very shallow, then you likely get disinflation. And notice, Alexei, I haven't said deflation, mm -hmm. because deflation is what kills this system, the credit creation system. And how does it kill it? It kills it because when you create new credit and you need to basically service this debt, what, what really matters is not the nominal costs, but it's the real cost of servicing this, this debt. Because inflation basically lowers the real amount of your debt due, correct? So if you're a borrower, inflation is good for you because the amount you need to give back next year is worth less, correct? Because inflation is eating away, real terms, that amount of debt, that mortgage you have. In case of deflation, that's a serious problem because your liability, your debt, actually becomes in real terms more expensive to service. And that is not acceptable in a system where you need to borrow more and more and create new credit because then the new credit in real terms, it's not cheaper, it's more expensive. So deflation is what scares the hell out of policymakers. And if you are a central banker that has the task of um, price stability, you, you might accept periods of inflation running a bit higher than your targets. Deflation is a no-go because it definitely kills the system. Disinflation is the period where inflation runs below trend. So if trend inflation people or policymakers love to have is 2%, it's far enough from zero. Yeah? So it's, there is still a 2% is a decent target. It's far enough from zero is very scary. It's close to deflation. This inflation is the period where inflation slows down to 1%, half percent, then policymakers start to freak out. And inflation is the period we're living now where inflation runs generally temporarily above 2%. And now it's, it's way above 2% for a while. So it depends on the, on the credit impulse, the pace of newly, newly created credit. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, we created a huge amount of credit. Governments went ballistic all over the world and banks even lent which is weird. Banks nowadays don't even don't, don't lend that much to the private sector. They did because the government was backing their, their loans. So the government was saying, please go lend to Alexei. I will, I will basically back up your credit risk. If he defaults, it's my problem, not your problem. Mm. So banks felt compelled to lend on top. But we created a huge, huge amount of credit. So the credit impulse actually went through the roof in my series. And if you give it enough time, about 12 months, 6 to 12 months, people who have received that credit from the private sector will say, oh, that's nice. I can now spend a bit more. Newly created money has been transferred to my bank account. They don't think in these terms, but the reality is that, and they will spend it. And then coupled with the supply side of the equation, which has had some issues, I mean, ports have been closed, companies have, factories have been closed. So the production of certain items has actually come to a halt. And the demand for these items has gone to the roof because newly created money has been transferred in a huge size to the private sector, balance sheet. Well, you can see, right? The, the, the mismatch between demand and supply creates this temporary inflation procedure. And then you have the flip side of it because now new credit is not being created. The government is not transferring any newly created money to the private sector anymore. Banks are not lending to the same pace anymore. Now you're in a phase where you my models are pointing to inflation slowing down materially over the next 9 to 12 months as a result of the credit impulse actually going down. It's basically a pendulum, which over time is skewed by the feature of the system and the, the willingness of policymakers not to hit the, mm -hmm. the scary deflation. 
that pendulum that swings, but it's skewed towards inflation being comfortably above 0% because policymakers will do everything it takes not to go into deflation that will burst the entire credit creation system. 